Well, since we want to give folks lots of time to have conversations throughout this next hour, we'll go ahead and um, start doing some introductions and hopefully um, everybody will be signed in by the time we get into our breakout rooms. So um, welcome everyone to Beyond Constraints, looking critically at and moving beyond the TPEs. And my name is Rosemary Wren. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a supervisor and lecturer at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and also over at Cuesta Community College. And do my co-presenters want to? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm Heather Ballinger. I'm a um, supervisor, lecturer, and program leader at Cal Poly Humble. Uh, my pronouns are also she, hers, and I'm, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Hey, hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope you all had a good lunch. Uh, Matt Wallace, uh, UC Davis, uh, lecturer and supervisor. All right. So and thank you all for joining us today. If everyone wants, it looks like several folks have already put in the chat a hello or a good morning. If you want to um, drop in the chat your name and uh, where you're coming from, we'd love to have you share that with us. And I'm going to go ahead and share screen here and get it into that. And so this is, again, this is our workshop on beyond constraints, looking critically at and moving beyond the TPEs. And what we were hoping to do is to continue the conversation about how we can um, coach and guide our, our candidates um, to look beyond the TPEs as a checklist and start to bring in more of the social justice and the anti-bias and anti-racist um, pedagogy that we're hoping they will explore as they develop their teaching styles. Uh, so our agenda is, it's pretty simple. We actually are hoping that we will not be talking very much, but that you will all be able to have conversations in breakout rooms. First, we're going to take a look at and talk about what are our initial understandings and questions about the TPEs. Um, how, how all the different schools have very different approaches to how much they focus in on the details within these. And so we thought it'd be a great chance for um, folks to share their experience and learn from one another. And then we're also then we'll go, go back into the same groups and look at how can we really prompt some more critical conversations with our, our, um, our candidates about the TPEs. And I, I know that the workshops this morning will probably greatly inform the conversations that we're about to have. Uh, and so I know that we have done this in uh, the other workshops that I've been in this morning, but this is something that has become a, a integral to my personal practice as a lecturer. Uh, and in any of the gatherings that I facilitate or participate in, I appreciate understanding the land that I'm on. Um, and at one in one event, someone said, "Oh, well, land acknowledgments are just really performative. They're just um, they're virtue signaling," and I took that pretty intensely because I know the land I'm on, and I'm in community with people whose ancestors have been on this land for quite some time. And so, I think when we're working with our candidates and we're in these classrooms with young children or um, teenagers in the high schools is what does it mean beyond the, the words that we say? What does it mean to be in partnership with the people whose land we're on? And I happen to be on Northern Chumash land. And right now the community um, is uh, petitioning for the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, which is the first marine sanctuary that has been put forth um, by a tribe. And that's my friend Violet right there. Uh, and this is the land and the sea that she is trying to protect uh, through this effort. And so when we talk about land acknowledgements going beyond um, words, it's getting into partnership. How can we support the people whose land we're on and, um, and build community that way? And so that's just something I wanted to bring to your awareness is that once you find out whose land we're on, um, think about how you can connect with them. And I think it's been mentioned that this is a really great resource, this nativeland.ca. Um, and then I 
I also found this guide to creating a land acknowledgement and a lot goes into it. And it's really, uh, it's actually really complicated to try to develop that because of the ways that different um, peoples have looked at whose land they're on. And, and the, our idea of ownership is very different than a lot of the indigenous peoples of our, of our, um, our continent. So just a little bit more in case it's something that is new to you or you didn't really understand what was going on with them. Uh, and this is the one that we've developed in our community. Um, and I happen to live on the, Ch the Northern Chumash had quite a large territory as I think a lot of us know. Um, and so both the schools that I work on work at and my own home are on these lands. So I'm going to turn it over to Matthew to talk about our um, norms for this workshop. Sure, thank you. Um, so uh, as we engage with each other and, and with uh, our ideas this afternoon, uh, we thought we'd uh, offer these norms um, as ways to help us all uh, get the most from our time together. Uh, so we hope that you all stay engaged, which is easier said than done. Uh, I don't know about you, I'm working from home today. I have a, a, a preteen who I need to make sure is, is making good choices uh, in the other room. I have a cat over here who sometimes uh, asks for attention. Um, so hopefully all of you can, uh, in your own way, find a space that minimizes all these distractions uh, and, and uh, find ways to stay um, here, present. Uh, speak your truth, uh, and do we think this is particularly important because we all have a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, a lot to contribute. Uh, uh, so please don't hold back. It's really important that, that you speak from where you're coming from, from your experiences, your truth. Um, and, and know that uh, sometimes that can be uncomfortable, uh, and you should expect to experience discomfort when you're really pushing yourself and, and um, uh, stepping outside of your comfort zone. Uh, and that's really important because uh, I think we'd all agree that that's where a lot of the learning and growth comes from uh, when we push ourselves to feel uncomfortable to be outside of our comfort zones uh, and that can happen in lots of different ways whether it's speaking up whether it's entertaining ideas um, whether it's um, uh, well in lots of different ways so however that looks for you I, I encourage you to do so uh, and we only have a limited amount of time together so expect uh, and accept that we may not be able to bring things to closure today uh, and that's okay but I hope it doesn't end here I hope all of you continue to mull over ideas and, and think through things uh, in ways that work uh, for you and your contacts. All right, and then the last sort of intro slide that we have um, is just related to this idea, kind of what um, Rosemary and Matt touched upon is we're, we're entering the spirit of inquiry and um, really hoping that uh, we're able to um, lead and uh, think about this idea that we can um, create and knowledge and bring about um, more creativity and understanding um, through this inquiry together. So um, we're on a journey um, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us and, and contribute your, your own thoughts and understanding to um, the TPEs and the supervision practice as well. So the um, the first thing, you know, the the title of this presentation and and hopefully what we're going the work that we're really going to be doing here is thinking about the TPEs and putting them into a, a critical context. And so, you know, what the TPEs are is their teacher performance expectations. They were recently uh, revised in 2016, and then literacy TPEs were have been recently added as well. And I'm sure um, you're all aware of those and all of the, we're, re, we're going through accreditation soon. So all of our accreditation syllabi have been marked and all of our supervision documents have really clear notations of when and where we're um, communicating to our candidates where um, the TPEs are located and sharing with them how they're part of a um, like the slide says, this body of knowledge for beginning teachers. And so Hopefully conversations with your candidates um, happen organically, but I also think that we have an opportunity here to take a critical lens at the TPE while also acknowledging that um, they are research-based and nationally aligned, and they're, they're starting a um, professional practice with new educators related to transitioning into the process of clearing their credential. Um, and as you know, there's a, there's, 
these are linked, although I know maybe we want to put the link in the chat for the placemat, or we have, you know, we have the placemat um, that Rosemary, you had in the resources document um, for this talk, but there's a placemat for the TPEs. It's a, it's a very easy kind of quick reference. So you can see that there are six main domains and then there's um, detailed substandards. And what we were noticing when, when the three of us were having our emergent conversation about the TPEs and trying to connect them to critical understandings and social justice practice is that some of them might seem more obvious um, and lend themselves towards uh, critical reflection or critical conversations that we have with our candidates. Others, um, I think that uh, it might not seem as obvious. And so maybe some of those will um, highlight in the breakout rooms that we, we go into, but all of them have space for this critical inquiry, um, which we were, were kind of highlighting um, in the previous slide with our quotations and this kind of understanding of pulling apart some of these TPEs and seeing how we can help our candidates and supervisors um, crit critically reflect on how to incorporate these into our practice. So uh, in that spirit, uh, we'd like to pose the following question, and we're not going to ask you yet to, to share anything or uh, uh, um, respond in the chat, although you're welcome to, uh, but we really just like you to think for a moment, take some time to yourself to think about what are some ways that we can guide our candidates to really think about uh, the TPEs through a social justice lens. And as Heather mentioned, some of them lend themselves, or they're pretty uh, obvious, uh, but others not necessarily so, or maybe some are just outright missing. Um, uh, something that's more equitable or social justice oriented. So how might we we guide the, our candidates, the teacher candidates we're working with, to think about all of these TPEs uh, through a, a lens of justice and equity and inclusion? All right, that was fast. On. Uh, to the breakout, our first breakout room. So, oh, oh, now we're going back. Oh, oh. Okay. Sorry, oh. I'm I'm having technical <laughs> difficulties. Do you want to go back to just on that one? Question? No, it's, it's it's quite all right. Uh, okay. <laughs> we'll we'll go here. Um, so now, what we'd like to do uh, is invite you all to a breakout room. Um, and in the breakout room, uh, we have the following questions here that we'd like to uh, uh, ask you to to discuss. I'd also add maybe first when you join your breakout room, just take a moment to. Um, Introduce yourself to your group mates. Maybe you know folks from there, but maybe you don't. So uh, just take a moment to say, hey, uh, and then uh, you can dive in um, with these three questions that you see here. And we'll add them to the chat, yes? Sure, we'll do that. And then I'm putting a link to the slides in the chat because we have typed out the TPEs um, and each group is going to have one batch of TPEs to look at. So in case you don't have them handy right next to your desk, um, you can check them out on the slides. Um, and then I'm also going to be putting in a link to a document where we can start recording some of our thoughts on the TPEs. So, yeah, so, yeah I was thinking, Rosemary, uh, one thing that, that might not be clear to participants yet, but I have created um, six breakout rooms uh, that represent the six um, domains. So whichever breakout room you go to would be the TPE of that your group will focus on. So if you're in breakout room number one, um, you'll be focusing on TPE number one and looking at engaging and supporting all students in learning and trying to address and answer hopefully taking notes for our mutual understanding about what your conversation was um, and we'll have facilitators popping into between the three of us since there's six tpes um, we've assigned two tpes to each of us so if we're not in your breakout room in the beginning we'll be coming in after we've checked in with our first um, sort of assigned group if that makes sense and then um, if you could take notes on your TPE that you end up in the group that you end up in based on your um, breakout room number. Uh, if you would, if you would take notes into the Google Doc that is provided in the chat, then when we get back together, we'll have a chance to sort of share out on what your group TPE uh, conversation looked like, because you'll only be talking about one of those six main domains, and then um, we'd like to have an opportunity to to share out 
uh, what the what the questions are or the key takeaways were regarding that conversation. Okay. Any questions about that? I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna put people in. I'm gonna create the breakout rooms now. All right, hope that went well. It always seems a little awkward when we have to pull people out mid-sentence in a breakout room. And if anyone has come to a conclusion about how to make that less weird, I would love to hear about it. Um, so we uh, in, the con in the groups that I was in, three and four, the conversations were really rich, but um, what I noticed was it's so, um, or one of the things that I noticed was people um, have a tendency, and I do this as well, where um, I table like, well, in my experience as a history social science supervisor, you know, so in, well, it's a little bit different in math. And so um, sometimes I think, uh, and maybe this is just my secondary brain on, we have a, a tendency to, um, I don't know, uh, like qualify some of the, some of the comments that are, are being said, but that I, I think I saw also a lot of um, themes that could be shared um, across uh, across disciplines as well. So hopefully you all got to that that place as well. Um, looking through the uh, the conversations on the on the Google sheet that we're looking at, I'm wondering if we could um, all share out by group and it, I think it makes the most sense to go chrono uh, by order of uh, chronologically, I guess or maybe what is it called, Matt, when it's a number? Chronolog it's not chronological. Numerical. Numerically. Numerical. Thank you. Geez. Numer um, in numerical order um, and have TPE uh, one share out kind of a little bit about their conversation um, that they had and the main takeaways from it. Sure. Well, I can, um, I was part of group one, so I could start maybe with the initial understandings and then I can um, throw it over to another one of my colleagues. Um, so one of the things that kind of um, came up were that we had idea that it really was focused on um, around increasing, promoting, or improving issues around diversity. Um, and we were thinking about diversity in um, in a number of ways, right? Relating to supporting emerging bilinguals, um, increasing access, thinking about universal design for learners or so neurodiverse learners, um, and then also culturally responsive instruction and curriculum. Um, and so broadly, we felt that this really meant that we wanted to ensure that all of our learners had meaningful access to materials in the curriculum and the lessons and activities um, that teacher candidates create. Um, a big part of this is really getting to know your learners, who they are, the assets that they come with. Um, and then related to that, capturing students' interests, um, again, making sure the curriculum is relevant and engaging and accessible for them. Um, and then another um, thought was that in many ways, whether it be implicit or explicit, um, the idea of social justice or critical reflection really does seem to be threaded and infused throughout uh, TPE1. Awesome, thank you, Nancy. Um, how about TPE2? I could start and then maybe Christina can go. We, we talked a lot about building the, in the classroom, that building the culture of you know acceptance, um, trying to find commonalities to um, create engagement for kids, for them to feel like there's a safe environment um, on, in here, you know. And one of the things that was brought up is if you start teaching uh, the character ed specifically kindness to make sure it goes all the way up through secondary because it seems that um, it creates a safer environment when you have an atmosphere that uh, the kindness is taken um, to heart and that everyone does it, it makes it more accepting for the students. Great, thank you. Um, would anybody, did anybody from TB2 want to share anything more? Was that, that sounded like a good review of that one. How about TPE? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was, I was unmuted. I didn't realize. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, we talked, I like the idea of starting locally to globally and because you have to first start with yourself and then your classroom and, and, and others and then on through throughout and also reflection, which we all, 
recognize that most student teacher candidates need to um, you know build on and then transferring that to the students to allow them to reflect and the environment of the safe space and and um, kindness i like that that janae i hope i'm saying that right um you know wants it to be a continuum throughout the school throughout the grades and then now hopefully throughout life um and to look at self-belief and work toward acceptance um uh, we, one of the examples was uh, from prison with history of, of slavery and recognizing that it's not just the one type of slavery that's often recognized here in the United States that uh, consignments and such, the Irish, um, Norwegians were mentioned, uh, where you were, um, oh gosh, Janice, what was it called? Um, where they had to work it off. Um, I and, think the word's uh, indentured. Indentured, thank you. Thank you. And so uh, all of those things, but the questions I, we, I started to come up with because we ran out of time. You guys never give us enough time. We want to keep talking. <laughs> uh, you know, like we need some, what, what are some practices that worked, uh, effective environment, strategies to promote trust and acceptance. All of those have to be built upon before you can really create that sense that you want to build. That's all. Great. Thank you, Janae and Christina. I appreciate that. Um, I was I started in in TPE three and we had a great conversation. But does somebody else um, from that group want to kind of share out the the takeaways from that um, conversation? We started talking about content versus kind of constructive constructivist ideas of putting um, content together. But did anybody else want to add to that? Other, you should probably add scientific inquiry. Yes, we definitely talked about, um, we talked about the, um, well, I think it was Amy um, who was in the group with us, um, was mentioning the national science standards. Um, and so we, we talked a bit about the difference between or the focus on content standards versus, um, versus uh, the TPEs and how those kind of um, sometimes come together in our supervision and sometimes are kind of at odds with each other. Um, and so the conversation between content versus curriculum uh, did did come up. Amy, did you want to add something to to that part of that conversation? I thought you were very articulate about that as well. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was um, I think it showed up in the chat because Nicole kindly put it in um, Put it in there um, but it's kind of just i'm wondering about the idea of as we look at tpe3 helping our candidates envision subject matters like you know such as you know uh, visual performing arts if visual performing arts is a verb you know and if science is a verb how might that affect how we look at each of those tpe components then and might that kind of open up some um, space for students to be more um, not only active, but to be able to bring themselves like more into the, the content area. Um, so instead of this like repository of knowledge, you know, or, or facts that needs to get covered, you know, you know, what if those te like what if subject areas are instead just actions that we're taking. Um, yeah. Can I can I jump in here? I wasn't in this room, but I want to continue on with what Amy is talking about. And this is one I think so much of teacher preparation lands right here. And there's a super huge focus on content, content, content. And I think it's really important for our candidates to understand the various disciplines. But I don't know about you, but education is very different from when I got my credential and there was no internet to use to find information. And so I think that this, this TPE does leave room for the how of teaching also. And I think it's really important that we be looking and, and maybe think about how we can bring in the, um, the more affective elements of content 
Uh, and because our, our, our candidates are often very focused on this because they wanna make sure they include everything and they wanna cover information. And I think that the way we talked with them about it can really have a, an influence. Okay, sorry, that's just a big strong one for me. <laughs> I'll be quiet. Yeah, that was, it was a great conversation. And then um, for the second half of TPE4, I'm gonna need um, somebody to, to jump in here and talk a little bit about um, what the focus was, because I came in towards the end, but it seemed like an equally rich discussion about, um, uh, for me, I, I kind of saw that we were highlighting some of the TPEs that are obviously socially um, justice oriented related to understanding students' cultural backgrounds for instructional planning purposes, um, but maybe somebody from that group could could add a little bit more to that one as well. Um, we, you know, it was interesting that um, the one of the rubrics from the engagement, what was it, um, one of the earlier sessions was brought up that it was really applicable to this as well to TPE4, especially the relationship part of that rubric with the three R's, if anybody was in that session. Um, just talked about how important it is to do that up front to get to know students, make them feel safe and comfortable and, and trusted, which also helps with behavior management. And all of those things, when you make them have a good start, kind of feeds into us being aware of their social, emotional place. Some of, so many of these things seem to overlap to me, which is, which is good. Um, we talked about um, I mean, I just looked at some of the, I remember TPE4 because I used to like it because it had a lot of qualitative um, elements to it. It also has, you know, things like rubrics, um, agendas. And I think that can fit into making students feel comfortable with kind of having anticipation for what's coming. Um, and then it was also brought up that the, uh, how we can wrap in all the SEL, MTSS stuff into TPE4 building into that, that part. There was something else I was really trying to remember to say. I'm looking at all this, these notes and I'm not remembering it. Um, I can add, Heidi. Jump in? Yeah, add. Hi, this is Jude. Um, thanks, Heidi, for um, leading us off. So I'm the, I'm the special education representative for all these TPEs. And so I teach in the grad department in, the, in special ed. And so these are the same things that we teach, that I teach um, with an eye towards the special education TPEs as well. Um, However, as I teach my mild, moderate support needs candidates of, about these TPEs, I really have an eye on collaboration for inclusion, especially if you've got these kids who are going to be in inclusion and collaborating with the general education counterparts. Um, you know, we talked a lot about, uh, there was some confusion um, in our group around when these literacy expectations were to be implemented. Um, and so we had spent a bit of our time earlier in that discussion um, and how that's being implemented in it's because obviously then in terms of planning and designing instruction, then this needs, that needs to be considered as well. Um, um, and there was in terms of student focus, um, you know, the candidates um, experiences tended to be more on curriculum and lesson planning rather than getting to know the folks, getting to know the learners. So um, there needs to be an emphasis around that as well. I think that's it that I wanted to add on. All right, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I agree the literacy TPEs are, are kind of, part of the problem is like they don't have, um, numbers associated with them and it's a it's a bunch of text so deciphering them and including them into our practice has been has been a challenge for us as well um, thanks for pointing those out how about um tpe5 do you want to start lisa um happy to thank you um we we had a great conversation um, that led to a question of why we assess, what do we wanna know, how does that get dealt with? And we were thinking about how TPEs and universal design don't fit seamlessly together. 
and how we make room for more opportunities for students to show us what they know and how do we branch out assessment so that we get more learners, more expression, more justice because we have more understanding of who our students are and they have spaces to build their competence and confidence in those expressions. Um, and we also, I love what Johnny said about assessment being a mirror in, into our teaching. You know, it's windows about students, but it's mirrors for us. And putting an emphasis on that makes more sense of it. Um, but I do, and we also talked about a little bit about assessment is currently very tied to funding and that that has an impact on an entire institution. And so how do kids not only do we make it a big scary monster, but then we show the monster's teeth, you know, and if we're not careful, then there's smoke, it, it's bad. So, you know, out of the dragon's face. So how do we help distinguish the, that, fund, that funding piece from what the learning might be? Uh, that was part of our conversation. Somebody want to climb on in there? If we could scroll Wrangle down. That dragon. If we could scroll down a little bit so we can see the rest of the entry. Um, thank you. A couple things. I so appreciated my colleagues in this conversation. Um, the UDL part, some of us come from the arts and we think about in an art classroom how people represent their learning versus how many other classrooms you don't get to have that variety. And part of that also is um, assessment comes with such deficit perspectives, trying to find out what people don't know rather than what people are able to do. So that's one of the an equity or justice perspective as well. Um, so one of the thoughts also comes up when we think about this mirror on our teaching. One question is, what is what does our assessment look like to our students? What are we saying to our students by the ways we assess them? Um, I'm going to throw out a big thought for everybody. And this just goes with TPAs, TPEs and such. The same question sits with us as well. The ways we go about assessing our candidates as they progress in their teaching experience? What are we saying about our belief in them and what they're capable of doing too? Um, and then the last thought I threw this out there too was just, you know, of the things that we think about the TPEs, the assessment one's the most critical one to consider around power relationships because assessment does so much damage, but it also has some, so much possibility. So, you know, if we're thinking about our candidates, helping them understand that relationship too, what, that's a, a worthwhile thing to wield in terms of growing students, but it also has its hazards too. So we had a good conversation. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's a very powerful like last statement, Johnny. I really appreciate it. Um, and then finally, one of my favorite TPEs, just because I think speaking of like power and and you know d nuance and I I find TPE six to be really interesting related to like kind of professional attitudes and professional um, demeanor as they're just defined by the candidate, the supervisor, the university. Um, how about that group? Did they want to share anything that um, came away from this discussion? I'd be happy to share what I my point was. But I hope others will share their equally uh, illuminating thoughts. Um, my primary responsibility in my um, role as a uh, supervisor is to help um, my candidates understand the diversity of learning styles and that we don't necessarily just want to call on students who have the fastest hands, that there are kids out there who have deep thoughts but process information a little bit more deliberately and need more time. Plus, we have a whole group of students who may be on 504 plans or IEPs that can learn and learn meaningfully if provided with adaptations and modifications that meet their cognitive styles. So, you know, I think UDL offers promise within this realm because it looks upon just not only cognitive cognition and um, academic prowess, but also an effective means for communicating and learning. So I think it's very important that our candidates be willing to have a growth mindset and, and with respect to, you know, listening to recommendations that are provided and acting on those recommendations when they make sense. I also, and I will be, I know I'm, 
take too much time probably, but I think it's important to have a two-way conversation and have our, our student teachers, our candidates challenge our beliefs and our pedagogy and our strategies as well. That way we have this open conversation that's reciprocal and not just, I know it all, I'm the bodhisattva and I'm gonna provide all the information you must listen. I don't want that kind of relationship. Thank you. I think I can add in here just um, one of the things we were talking about in regards to this particular TPE is um, how supporting and engaging both our students as well as those we work with in the community in the in the schools is how important the openness is, um, how important it is to be willing and able to um, you know, consistently take in new information re and, and look at our, our own biases as well as, you know, um, those of others around us. Um, but really recognizing that this is a dispositional issue as much as anything else, because it's not, um, I mean, I, I agree, it's, it's, a, it's a great one to, to look at, but it's also sometimes really hard to truly measure um, and so it becomes more of something that's internal in a lot of ways and where our, our students, our, our teacher candidates, as well as those we're working with in the community, how we look at it as a more global issue of those dispositions and those willingness to take on new ideas. And, um, but it's, it's not something you can easily just check mark, you know, just like, oh, they did that. It's, it's something that's a little bit more global in that sense. Um, and I, I know one of the things we talked about, you know, and others can jump in here from the group, of course, but, um, but how important it is then as supervisors and faculty or anyone working with our teacher candidates, as well as those in the community, is that we continually model that and that we're sharing with them how we're taking it forward and how we're looking at ways of, of um, engaging and supporting others and, and looking at their internal biases as well, you know, external, internal, the whole thing and, and moving forward. Um, but it's, it's not as easy to just check it off in a box. Looks it like looks, Lisa has her hand Lisa up. Lisa, raise her hand. Thank, um, thank you. I wanted to ask people's opinion about their understanding of TPE6 in this way. I, I think of it as helping student candidates, teacher candidates have a sense of advocacy for themselves. And maybe this is the wrong TPE for that, I don't know. But that the world of a school, the world of a classroom, the nuance that how do we build teams? How do I find my allies? How do I sit down and write myself a teaching statement that allows me to deal with all of the audiences that are going to come for me <laughs> as a teacher and how am I going to prioritize my responses and keep my growth happening through that noise and ideally joy all those things it, am I barking up the wrong TPE <laughs> <laughs> that was good <laughs> Jude, well, I, I think oh, Lisa, that has a lot to do with oh, that thank you Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I, okay. I just wanted to say that I, I think that connected nicely to what, what we were talking about in, in that modeling element, as well as, as showing you know how, how to make those connections, how to take care of yourself, how to advocate when you need to, how, um, and that it's not automatic. I don't think it's automatic for, I mean, for some it, it may feel that way, but I think that there needs to be some guidance in that area as well, obviously. Can I, yeah, can I? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, it's um, a, oh, wait. I, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> we all are so impassioned over the CP6. <laughs> I mean, I think it is the, for me, it's the most important one in terms of sustainability of the teaching of, the, of our troops, right? Or of our people um, in the industry. We're teaching, we've, a lot of us have already, you know, made our, paid our dues and and we wanna be able to sustain them and not burn them out. So I always come from a burnout prevention piece, which then helps them become more um, self-compassionate and not take things personally because they often take things personally and the collaboration piece around stakeholders, 
um, on on and off campus is is really important, and to be to be mindful of that. And I, I, I actually wonder where a lot of this compassion training comes, because this is where sort of my research is focusing on and trying to help prevent teacher burnout. So I'll be quiet. Thank you. Hi, um, so I, I'm seeing lots of hands. And this, this is great, by the way. Thank you, everyone, for uh, sharing. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the people who have their hands up, but I'm also looking at the time. I know we only have a minute left before the 10 minute break. So uh, we, we'll, we'll stick around after uh, the 140 end time. For those of you who'd like to continue the conversation, great. For those of you who are, are going to continue on to your next session, great. Uh, I just want to leave you with a couple of questions uh, to consider. We didn't get a chance to get to them today. Um, so maybe treat this as food for thought. And I don't know if um, somebody is uh, putting the slides back up. Um, hopefully they are, but hey, there we are. Here's, here's the other questions uh, that we had hoped to pose to you all. And again, this will just be some food for thought for you. So in what ways can we guide our candidates to engage with the TPEs through a, a more critical lens in order to cultivate social justice in their classrooms? Uh, and what are some, well, some questions, uh, conversation starters specific to this TPE that you might use as you engage in debriefs, as you engage in pre-lesson uh, meetings and, and so on. So um, I'll leave this for all of you to consider, think about. Thank you so much, everyone, for the conversation. Very much enjoyed it. Lots of great stuff here today. Uh, if you'd like to stick around and keep the conversation going, hey, I think we'll be here. Uh, and for those of you who are going to take out, take off, um, I hope you enjoy the rest of today. Hope to see you tomorrow and hope we all can continue these great conversations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank you, everyone. So anyone else care? I saw some hands up earlier. Anyone care to uh, continue? I, I do have a question. Is, are you, I'm assuming this is a special, I mean, general ed TPE. Do you guys talk to or look at the special ed TPEs as well or not at all? Okay. Not much. I'm not going to lie to you. I most it's more on I, I've taught in the special ed program mm -hmm. um, but for methods and we yeah. almost do the opposite where we like kind of expose like we look at from the we like compare and contrast right. like these are the TPEs and then you also have these on top of them. So we talk to the special ed candidates about them, but no, that's a definitely an area for growth. I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, on, on both sides too, right? Like the special ed teachers and collaboration and such, because that's kind of where we're headed. Thank you. And Jude, uh, just to underscore that for a minute, notice all the stuff from, from special ed in California Department of Education, how much of that, like RTI and all that stuff, mm -hmm. flowed into uh, general ed and they have no idea. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, oh, yeah. that's the thing. That's you where, know, but we have the toolbox. Yeah. You know, yeah, um, I mean, I teach the UDL piece, the RTI, the MCSS, and the adolescent literacy in my special education program. So, um, so that they can have the same vernacular when they're talking to you all. So, you know, and all the strategies, right? And so we team teach, we collaborate, all of it. So, all of the pedagogical approach with co teaching, we okay. teach, or I teach that. So, um, so I was just curious. Uh, I, I'm I'm not sure if this comment is particularly relevant to Jermaine. I, I sometimes have a concern that we um, present social justice as sort of a, another layer on top of the TPEs, as opposed to um, good teaching being an act of social justice. And that, um, uh, the, the TPEs properly understood are infused with social justice, that is being inclusive and being equitable and um, developing relationships and um, uh, creating a caring community. Uh, and that when we present social justice as another thing student teachers need to be thinking about above and beyond, um, we, we 
we turn it into some sort of um, burdensome another checkbox as opposed to an incorporation of what the act of education and teaching is, which in my mind uh, is intended to be uh, equity and social justice. I, I might be missing um, something here. Do you like to call on one of us? Uh, 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 I think uh, Lisa has been. Uh... Uh, what you remind me of, and I appreciate you sharing your point of view, what you remind me of is the moment we're in. And you remind me of the, the moment we're in to review how we thought about that. And that maybe we weren't, well, not maybe, we weren't explicit enough. And so I don't think it's a question of us not feeling like teaching is social justice or not feeling that we've been inclusive, but we've got to forget double down. We're like hundo down, you know, like it's just not enough given how we've all been taught. Not only yeah. the, the frameworks and the paradigms, of how we were lectured to and taught. Um, but yeah. now that our audiences have changed and our technology has changed and our history is being dealt with, it um, just needs to be more explicit, which is not to say it needs to stand out. It's how you deliver it that allows it to be the woven in. Does that make, does that sound familiar well, to anyone? Yeah, and as a person of color though, I, I think there's, there's a lot more improvement around how we can, and I'm and as person in higher ed faculty, right? I mean, I inherit a lot of these things, and there's not a stitch of social justice in it. And I, I mean, it's aspirational, Ted. I love it, yes, but in practice, it's missing. Well, if I could just, I don't know, uh, challenge or push back a little bit, you know, um, what I've observed is um, some teachers sort of wearing um, uh, social justice and equity badge and not attending to real core strategies of how to be actively inclusive and are passively exclusive, even in their deliverance of messages overt messages of social justice where they are not um, uh, activating um, uh, cognitive processing of what's going on for all students. And so, you know, the, we, we miss what's there um, and core to inclusivity. Um, and in, in, in instead, sometimes wear the badge through verbal verbalization, uh, simple verbalization of it. And I, I might be, you know, essentializing some things, but um, uh, you know, student teachers are uh, so overwhelmed by all that they need to be considering. I think we miss what our most powerful means of social justice is when we don't really focus on what are the strategies of real active inclusion. 